Minisode 6.1 Escaping the Past We are no more than pieces of our past, puzzles put together by a child. A jigsaw of experiences, some joyous, some forgettable, some tainted. But if we're lucky, we don't find the edges too quickly. Welcome back to a very special episode, or mini-sode, if you will, of Girls Who Don't D&D. It's been a few weeks now since we posted our first episodes online, and to say we're surprised by the response would be an understatement. But of course, nothing ever goes to plan, especially in D&D, as we prepared to record our seventh episode. In fact, it was the very same day, if I'm not wrong. We were sent into a short seven-day lockdown. That has now been extended quite a few times now. Lots of people are in the same situation. What it meant, though, is that we were woefully unprepared for sending out our next episode on anything resembling the schedule we wanted to keep. But because so many of you listened, and from all over the world too, from places I had to look up, like a Spanish Fork in Utah and a Welsh town called, and I'm going to mess this up, of course, Abbasdwith, people from all over the world, well, we wanted to keep going. So whatever happens next is really your fault. Frankly, I wash my hands of it. Our minisodes are one-on-one flashback adventures for each of the girls who don't D&D, and they are part of our story. They just weren't meant to happen yet. We've never tried anything like this before, so we hope it works just as much as I'm sure you do. They fit right in after the girls are hit by the avalanche that was pummeling towards them, which was meant to be the next problem for our girls to solve at the beginning of our very next episode. So don't worry, that is still where we will start our next full episode, but for now, we're going to play what happens when the avalanche hits them. Joining me today is Stacey, otherwise known as Karin. You there, Stacey? Yes, hello. Uh, I've got a couple of quick questions for you before we get going. When you were playing Karin the Barbarian, who is also a druid, what goes through your mind in the decision-making process? Uh, I try to stay true to my Karin character, is what I'm always trying to do. I'm trying to remember my character sheet and remembering her fun quirks, like thinking that she is um, pretty confident in the way that the odds are always in her favour and I think that's something that stuck out to me so I'm always trying to make very bold moves because she believes that they're going to work. Uh, the other thing was how, how you've, how's it been for you since we got online and people actually started listening to us? Oh my gosh, amazing and I have to say um, I'm, I'm doing a shout out to Crow's Road on Instagram because they wrote a really lovely message and Crow's Road, if you are listening right now, I was I went back to the group chat and I was like, oh my god, should I like the comment? Is that too needy? I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna like it. It's not, is it too much? If I like it, I'm just gonna like it. And then I, I liked the comment. So if you say something nice to us, we're almost certainly going to like it. That's the sort of people we are. <laughs> and we don't care what it is. If you just say to us, you used a nice font, we're like, yes, we did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! You're getting a heart emoji. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, are you ready to play? I'm so ready to play. Then let's get started. It's just one girl, a dragon, and it's not very long. Karin. Hold on, I'm what so sorry. What just happened? I haven't poured a drink. Hold on. Sorry. Just pause. Pause there. I, d- I didn't even get past I was waiting for you and it was 8.41 and I was already at like 8.20 and so I just kept mm. drinking. I'm so sorry. All I heard is, it's just my- I'm going to need to be drunk <laughs> in order to finish this episode. We haven't started yet is what I just heard. It is Friday and we're in lockdown. I've been waiting for this all week. True, true, true. Curry, the roar of crashing snow and ice replaces whatever Freya was trying to yell at you. You try to call back. We don't have time for this. But instead, the wall of white engulfs you. Tumbling and falling, your body is being bashed. You're running out of air. The white quickly becomes black. Through the haze of thoughts rushing through your mind, suddenly there is clarity. Suddenly there is air and light, bright yellow sunlight, blue skies through an open window, the incredible comfort of a bed that feels like clouds wrapped around you. You blink once, and then there's the smell of... Do you, do you like bacon? Are you a bacon person? Are you kidding me? I just bought a kilo yesterday. Bacon's my world. Then it's bacon. Because if it was no, it was going to be pancakes. But clearly it's bacon. It's a kilo. It's a kilo of bacon. <laughs> you misunderstand. I put bacon on pancakes and then drown it in maple syrup. Oh, okay. It's bacon and you can clearly smell pancakes. That sounds like you've woken up to a nice experience anyway. A handsome man enters the cosy room. <gasps> yeah, he does. <laughs> yes, girl. Get a girl. <laughs> he doesn't really smile, but there's a kindness to his face, an almost accidental light in his eyes. For a moment, he seems lost in his thoughts. But when he sees you, 
Whatever mystery had been clouding his mind seems quickly solved. Don't worry, he says. Breakfast is on its way and Zen's over at your mother's place. You've got the morning to yourself. Even the cat's leaving us alone. Zen or Ben? Zen's your daughter. Sorry, what? Yeah. My daughter? Yes. Okay, this body doesn't look like it's had a daughter, so, so I'm very <laughs> confused. Her name is Zen and Zen means complete happiness, so that checks out. And that complete happiness is disrupted by the sound of drums and horns, something blaring from outside your room. What would you like to do? Uh, I'm going to eat some bacon because I'm going to need some energy. So I'm just going to roll for that. You go ahead and roll. I got a six. Do I get the bacon? I think only a one would mean you'd fail to eat bacon. Okay, I eat the bacon. As screams come from outside your room, you go, mmm, bacon. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> All right, what do you want to do? Okay, is it, you said there was a horn blowing? A horn, yes. Like what kind of horn? Is it? You are hearing like a war horn. Uh, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> out the yeah, you're not out there going, oh, this is excellent. Like, oh, this is grooving. Yeah. So a warning horn of some yes. sort. Well, it's either a warning oh, horn or it's something from an army coming towards you. Like it's, it's, well, it's going to be the, the latter. It's an army. It's an army. You can't tell that from inside your room, but the horn is not something you... I love it. <laughs> when the girls and I ask so many questions of procrastinate so much that you just end up giving us answers. I'm just like, fuck it, it's an army. <laughs> I'm like, what kind of horn? And you're like, oh, the kind of horn that tells you an army is coming, okay, God. <laughs> right, so now I know <laughs> there's an army. <laughs> Uh, you still haven't told me actually what you want to do. Is this still... Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. This, this is meant to be a short episode and mostly it's about eating bacon so far. Um, I would like to do a perception eating. check. Uh, okay, give me a roll. That's a solid 20. You just rolled a 20. It's an 8. <laughs> you can't see me. <laughs> yes, the lies. <laughs> the lies began instantly, didn't they? It didn't take long. And you know what? Each of you will try that same thing on me at least once. <laughs> uh, with an 8, all you can tell... Uh, is that there is carnage going on outside. People are screaming. You can hear these loud horns in the distance. Uh, People are already running around. And my daughter is at my mother's place. Is that what you said? Yes. Karin would want to go check on her daughter before anything else. Because, like, my mother, I'm assuming, is... Is frail and old. Well, she's not that frail. She's your mum and she, you know, she's she's pretty buff. Oh, my actually. God, sorry. I was thinking of my own mother. Karin's mother, of course. She's probably a druid and she's pretty strong. Karin's mother, I think, is one of those people who likes to have photos done with her daughter so she can go, which one's my, my, my sister? No. <laughs> oh, my sister. No. Oh, my God, Yeru. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. My Stop daughter. it. Stop it, Yeru. It's, it's not too far away. Uh, uh, and you find your mother, and she's just gathering things. Zen is there. She's just a young girl. She's probably about eight, I would say, and they're getting ready to leave. I'll give you the briefest description of Zen. She has, of course, a shock of pink hair, just like a mother. Love Not that. all the way through, of course, just like some of it's being coloured as if it was a mother-daughter day. Your husband is, is trying to gather as much as he can, but he says to you, we'll go to the mountains. They won't find us there. They won't. But the men will need you. They trust you. You know, we'll be okay. You go and help the men. You've got to buy us some time. Uh, Women are running around, clutching children to their chests, and they're heading towards, well, they're heading out of the town, heading towards these mountains uh, that line the end of a long, open green plain. The peaks seem so far away, but they are panicked and running. What do you want to do? I'm going to talk to my daughter. I'm going to say, honey. Yes, mummy, she says. Listen to mama. You're going to be okay. You're going to be safe. Because I am supremely confident that whatever is happening... I'm going to fix this. So you go with daddy, go into the mountains, go with all the other people and you just hide there and mama has got this like she always got this, okay? I know, mum, she says. And then I say to my husband, off you go, my sweet baby angel. He looks at you again like he believes in you more than he even believes in himself. He kisses you quite passionately and then Zen grabs his hand and says, Dad, we can't leave without... He looks at her and says, I know, I know. We'll go get him. And then they leave. Okay, bye doll. Be careful. The men of the village are stumbling together as the horns blast again. There is definitely fear in their eyes and in the way they move. Across the waters of the nearby bay, boats are approaching. At first it seems like just a few, but as your eyes adjust, they become dozens. Some of the men turn to you for guidance. I see, that's right. I'm your leader. You respect me when you look at me for guidance. All right, they do. They turn to you as their leader. Do I still have that axe? Do you I have do that axe? Do not in the past? have your axe in the past. Well, what the frick do I have in the past, Corey? I don't know. A spunky attitude. <laughs> uh, just 
Then there was sword Do I have lying by. Yeah, you've got a sword and a shield. Okay, all right. I'm gonna grab any weapons that is accessible to me 400 years prior. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. This is happening uh, 400 years ago. This is happening in your past. Uh, so you've picked up on that, and now you're standing in front of a group of men who look to you for some sort of guidance. Right. So I'm still like I'm still chewing on my bacon from this morning, and I'm like. Still bacon in your teeth. <laughs> I'm like, all right, this situation is not ideal. It is not ideal. Definitely didn't plan for this because we're a very peaceful village. And to be honest with you, we are abysmally unprepared. I was just like making out with my hot husband. He was making me bacon. Okay. Give me a roll for um, persuasion. But I haven't done anything yet. It's a two for persuasion, minus one. So that is a one. Okay, I am not surprised that that wasn't particularly persuading. <laughs> some of the men from the back of the group start slinking away in other directions. Um, some of them drop their swords as if to say, well, clearly we're not going to need these, <laughs> and start looking for back alleys to sneak off to the mountains with everybody else. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Jerry, get back here. Get back. Where do you think you're going? It's always Jerry. Where do you think you're going? Do you want me to tell Martha, your wife, that you just chickened out right now while your daughter Lily is just like running away in those hills? Jerry, get back here. Yeah, and, and tell your little co to get back here too. Jerry walks back, he shuffles, he kicks around the dirt a little bit. Tell your friends, Jerry. Come on, everyone. She's right, you know. They all put their head down a little. All right, we're going down to these ships. We're going to see what these mother effers want. Okay. As you arrive at the beach, uh, you can tell that quite a few boats have landed uh, on the on the shoreline, it's not really a beach; it's more of a bay area. But as you arrive there, you can see uh, large numbers of, I guess we can call them soldiers, but they're just so heavily armoured that you can't really tell what they are. Uh, the bright sun just glints off the metal and is almost blinding. There are no gaps in some areas of the, of these armour that you would expect. You normally see gaps between things, but there are very rarely gaps. No space to see what type of creature is beneath them. Even the helmets don't have that slit that they normally have for eyes. They leap from the boats and they start making a formation. They just simply form a long line and then they all pull swords from behind their backs with these thick, chunky metal hands. Then they stop and they stomp the ground once, twice, three times. And then they charge. Let's get stabbing. One of the men sort of arrives behind you. Or not, it seems like he's better armed, better better armour. Not great armour by any means, but he certainly has better than everybody else. And he looks towards you and says, Emissary, I will take it from here. And he steps forward and tries to marshal the men a little bit as well. And he starts pointing in different directions. Uh, and so they start charging towards the fight. It's pretty clear to you almost immediately that your people are going to be absolutely wiped out by these creatures. They're, they're better than everyone you have. And they're just slicing through anyone they find. Soldiers, villagers, everybody. All right, I was going to turn around and be like, where the hell have you been, Tim? Of course it's Tim. Thanks for showing up. And I'm going to look at the men and be like, pointing at him with my thumb like this guy, right? <laughs> he says again, emissary, I'll take it from here. And uh, he pushes, pushes through the men and pulls out a sword and starts getting into the battle. Now, he's not too bad at this. Uh, what would you actually like to do, though? You've, you've let everybody else charge in. Yeah, I'm supervising. Karin is supervising. <laughs> you know, she's standing up higher than everyone else. She's holding her sword with the point down and like, you know, like a walking stick. Like point down and she's kind of like just overseeing things. You know what I mean? Like, she's like, oh, you. Yeah, over to the left, to the left, to the right, to the middle. You're doing great, honey. Give me an insight check. Oh, you're fucking shitting me. It's a one minus one, so... I don't have any insight. <laughs> yeah. You... Just, no, you don't have any insight. In fact, if anything, you think this is going very well. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> the men the men are undergoing some sort of slaughter. Uh, there are, there's just heads being lopped off. And the, 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 the beasts, uh, the armoured beasts that are moving towards you aren't even slowing down. Uh, they're getting closer to you now. And then suddenly, there's another trumpet sound. And they all stop. They all stand bolt upright and they step back from anybody fighting them at all. They even move aside until there's a path formed and a man steps off one of the boats and casually walks through this new path. He seems part machine, part man-made, part magic and he seems to be mostly armoured as well like the others except there's some flowing dark hair coming from underneath his helmet. He seems a little shorter than the others if anything. He doesn't appear to be carrying any weapons. 
just the same heavy silver gauntlets that all the other warriors have. Well, almost the same. Uh, and he says, Strange that they would send me here for you. So small. So fragile. And then the gauntlet on his left hand suddenly shoots out from its arm and a chain with a chain swinging behind it and it flings out towards you. Give me a dexterity check. What is with me tonight? It's a two. Plus one. Oh, good. Three. <laughs> um, the gauntlet just slams into you and grabs you around the neck and it slowly starts retracting. The chain is joined to him and it starts pulling you towards him. And you are basically being dragged by your throat. Uh, you get right up close to him and you're looking at him. You can see his eyes. Give me a perception check. Nine plus, plus one, so ten. You don't really notice anything about him apart from the fact that he smells much sweeter than you would expect for a man in a battle. It's almost a soft fragrance. And then he just flings you to the side as if you weren't what he was looking for. Get out of the way. And then he shoots his gauntlet out again. Now this time you can see it's heading towards a boy who was hiding uh, not too far behind you before. And I'm going to just check to see whether it gets him or not. Uh, it smashes into a wall right near his head. But misses and the boy bolts. He starts running through the town. The man steps back and looks at all the soldiers and says, Find him. And they all start spreading out through the town. Um, I'm going to jump in front of him and be like, Oi, what the hell do you want? He flings his hand towards you like he's backhanding you. Fortunately, it's an abysmal roll. He's rolled a three, so even though he's not too shabby, uh, he misses you. He, it's almost like he overestimated how tall you'd be. He expected you to be a more import and swung over your head. Uh, but he just steps straight past you and keeps moving. Okay, I'm going to grab him by those long black locks and be like, Oi! I said, what do you want? You grab him by the hair. What do you want? He grabs you around the neck again with the gauntlet, so you've got hold of each other. And he didn't even try to dodge. He just doesn't think you're important. Give me a strength check. Opposed strength. Yep. Okay. And we'll see whether he can grab you or you can pull away from him. Well, my strength is plus three, so good luck, mother effer. Oh, shit. It's a two, so I've got a five. <laughs> Okay, he rolled better than you uh, significantly, and he has grabbed you around the neck as well. And he looks directly at you and says, Pathetic thing. You are not worth my time. Uh, and then he spits a little when he says pathetic. And then, uh, and, and because his helmet is a little bit different from the others, the spray does come out and hit you. How dare you? And he flings you away again and starts walking away from you. Did he just throw me to the ground again? And steps over you because you're not worth anything to him. Oh my god. I know, the height of the man. The audacity. How dare he? Um, yeah, okay, well, I, like, I'm not taking that. I look around and see that his soldiers are after my boy, so I am going to run ahead of them because they seem to be marching solidly, but I can sprint. They're, they're going into huts, uh, which they're also starting to light on fire. A lot of your people have managed to get away uh, there are clearly still people who didn't get away quickly uh, who are in the village and uh, some of those are being dragged in the street and so forth but there are a lot of people who did get away i think i'm actually going to flip and cartwheel my way across these things across what things across the rooftops of the rooftops of the huts that they're trying to set on fire give me an acrobatics check i'm going to flip onto the rooftops all right i like it so let's do it with advantage because this seems to me i would say that a fairly drunken Karin has possibly come home via this rooftop method in the past. <laughs> this is something she's done before. 14. Okay, so you managed to get to the top of one of the buildings that isn't burning, and you can see across the top of those, you can see there are 30, 40 of these soldiers now going into different huts, and as they come out, they light them on fire to make sure that nothing could go back in at any stage. And they are clearly uh, moving well together. It's almost as though they think together. They're spreading out and, as if they've got a plan. I'm going to try a perception check to see if I can see the boy. And that's a 12. My perception is always plus one, so it's a 13. You see something. You see the back of a foot heading into a hut. And it looks like it's one actually near your house. Near my house. Near the one you came from, yeah, in the morning. So what I'm going to do is do some front flips and back flips and cartwheels across the rooftops till I get to my house to check it out. Not advantage this time, because there's actually no reason for you to do the cartwheel. 
the cartwheels and front flips. <laughs> can I decide how I land on that second rooftop? Well, if the dice tells you you can, let's find out. With that beautiful roll of 19. <laughs> Damn. All right, describe your hero's landing to me. Okay, so I have backflipped and I have landed on one knee down, one knee up, hand to my left with fingertips on the ground. I'm looking up, I'm looking fierce, I'm looking wild, and the wind is slightly just like tussling my long pink pastel hair behind my shoulders. You must now give me a roll. I want to know whether your hair lands right. Okay. <laughs> it's a flat out D20. Anything less than 10 and then you get hair It is a face. literal 10. Oh, the hair lands just across the shoulders and doesn't block your eyes. I was going to give you disadvantage on the next one. In fact, I really want to. <laughs> so it'll land really pretty like. Okay, cool. So no, you land, you land and the hair goes perfectly. Everything works out. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got one more hut to get to and it is your hut. You can see your place and it is on fire. It's burning. I'm going to backflip and somersault and land. Is there a reason to do, is there a reason for that? Clip? Yeah, it's just faster. It's just faster and more agile. Okay, okay. Because I know how to play D&D &D now. <laughs> it's a 15. I killed it. You smashed it. Another great landing. So do you want to land on the roof or do you want to land in the entrance? The roof is on fire. I just want to make that clear. I'll, I want to do a beautiful flip onto the roof, run across the roof and then like, run, like do a nice light jump down to the ground to my house where I'm going to save that boy. I'm going to save that boy. Corinne, having been beaten to the ground by this man twice, lands right in front of her own house, which is now on fire. And as soon as she does that, something goes thud to the back of her head. <gasps> no. Makes the same noise as before, that metal sort of clanging set of sound as this gauntlet smashes you in the back of the head again. Yes, you're fine in this time period. You start with a normal amount of hit points, and he has just hit you for 12. I got 32 hit points. 32. Well, you just lost, was it 12? I don't want to lose 12, so... We've discussed this, Corrine. <laughs> when someone hits you, the pain happens. I'm fine. <laughs> that leaves me with 20. Uh, so you managed to stay on your feet, but you're a little bit dazed. I think you know exactly what's behind you and how close that might be. Uh, what would you like to do? He hit me, I'm dazed and confused, but I've decided I don't care about that. I want to go find this boy because I know they're after this boy. Okay. Uh, you stumble into the room. Thick black smoke willows around the ceiling and the heat is licking at your skin but the boy is nowhere to be seen so this is my heart so i would like to do an insight check um how, how would an insight check work here why zen and i play a lot of hide and go seek in that little hut of ours all right so you know all the good hiding places in the room is what you're trying to tell me i know all of them i know all of them i like she would hide somewhere she'll think was so original but i'm like i'll just pretend i can't find you for a while you, is is karen is Karin one of those parents who goes, yes, it's time for hide and go seek. And then when you know where she's hiding, but you're like, I just need another two minutes. So I'm just not going to find you yet. Yeah, I'm actually just like pouring myself some mead. I assume 400 years ago I was drinking mead. Yep, yep. <laughs> need some me and some mead time. <laughs> me and mead. Uh, okay, well, give me a, give me that roll. Ooh, boy, it's a 19 plus two. You better believe it. Uh, you check through the different parts of the room, cupboards behind things, under beds, near rugs, whatever. I don't know why they'd hide near, near or under a rug. <laughs> and you don't find him. He's under a rug. <laughs> you find nothing. There's children hiding under the rugs. <laughs> it's like, how discreet. <laughs> Yeah, well, in the movies, people hide behind a curtain all the time as if it's going to work, and they always go, look at the feet underneath the curtain. That checks out because there's space between the window and the curtain. A rug is just floor rug. <laughs> there really isn't a lot of space, is there? I am going to make it my thing that in the future, somebody is going to hide out under a rug from you people. You're going to be searching for someone, and you're not going to check under the rug, and I'm going to be like, well, there you go. I should have checked under the rug. I like Corey loves rugs. Well, yeah, we'll see. Perception check, is there a rug? Check under it. <laughs> oh, look, a dragon. Um, Stop. Look, the short, short version of this is, you can't find him. But, uh, the assumption is he's gone already. He's moved on. But, uh, the room is burning around you now. Um, you can feel the smoke starting to billow towards you, and it's starting to come through the thatched roof and make that crackling sound, pieces of wood starting to fall around you. A piece of wood hits you on the back for a moment and knocks you to the ground into the ash. feel a little dazed for a second, but through blurred eyes, you can see an exit on the other side. 
of the room. So you pick yourself up and you run out of the room and when you get out you see the rest of the village is now mostly alight. The screaming has started to die down but now there's the roar of flames and the footsteps marching, marching and just constantly searching. Okay, I just want to find some clear air at this point. So I'm going to run out of the smoke wherever that is so I can get a better view of what's happening. Well, there's a marketplace nearby. That's probably a bit more open space if you want to get into that. Yeah, I want to get some open space. So I'm going to pull my shirt up over my mouth and I'm going to run towards some open space. So as you're running through the, into this marketplace, give me another perception check to see if you notice anything as you arrive there. Okay, so 11 plus 1 is 12. There's nothing standing out too much straight away. There's a lot of bits of things knocked over. There's uh, you know fruit lying on the ground, fresh catch of the day is all smashed up, uh, but they haven't really, that's just probably from all the people the village is trying to leave. Uh, you hear, somehow, you hear uh, a noise like something has been knocked over. You see a, a bunch of tables on the side where they had sort of potions and drinks and, oh, you know what, it's just mead. This is where they sell the mead and like everywhere else in this... The in mead. This, <laughs> It's called Mead for Me, as you established before. <laughs> I'm like, I know that sound. <laughs> yeah, it's just a picture of middle-aged women uh, drinking large amounts of, of mead. <laughs> it's, it's 12 o'clock somewhere. I've heard that before. That's their slogan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the drink of choice of the housewife of your village. Next to it, of course, is Mead for Men, just to make sure that there's no, there's no inequality here. It's pointlessly gendered, is what I'm saying. Pointlessly gendered, yeah, because like the mead is just the same, except that the mead for men comes in a bigger cup, and like the font's different. It's more aggressive. It's underneath it says thunder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just or like plus, just for no reason. Like the girls want to be called temptation. Of course it is. But I have an eyeshadow and a lipstick and a blush, all called temptation. Oh, this one's different though. On the on the label is a lawnmower man. That's it. There's a man <laughs> without a shirt on mowing the lawn, and this is called temptation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, you hear something over by the mead table. I am who I am, so I kind of strut over there, and I notice that there's some me for mead, whatever it's called. <laughs> so I pick it up, and I knock it back. It's the passion pop of the mead world, I should say that. It's, it's not good stuff. I can taste it. Hey, you'll taste it on the way down, and you'll taste it on the way back, <laughs> uh, which is also its slogan. That's what it says on the front. Drink once, taste twice. <laughs> <laughs> so I just sculled that back. And I'm, I'm like kind of glaring around for what that noise was. And you see uh, a little boy hiding behind the table. You can see he's terrified. He's utterly terrified. But he does seem to have a moment of recognition when he sees you. Um, he knows who you are. So I go over. I'm like, hey, buddy. Are you okay? He's not. What's your name? <laughs> He's not a possum. All I know is that my character is drunk, I'm a little drunk, and what feels authentic to me is saying, hey buddy, what's your name? That's, that's role playing. Uh, he says, my name is Hark, Emissary. Hark, you say? What a beautiful name. Yeah, that's what everyone, that's what everyone calls me. What a beautiful name, I say, and I don't think to myself at all, it sounds like when you're being like, I don't say that because he looks scared and he looks fragile and vulnerable and I don't think he needs that right now. <laughs> when I think of the word hark, I hear hark the herald angels sing and you hear somebody clearing their throat. <laughs> and I'm like, hark, honey, my darling, what is wrong? What's wrong? Everyone's gone. Everyone's gone, he says, and he seems terrified and doesn't know what to do next. Again from behind you, you hear that clanging metal coming through the air, but this time you know what it means. So give me another roll, or actually choose uh, what you'd like to do. It could hit Hark. I'm going to throw myself on top of Hark and get down on the ground. And wait for him to pull that thing back and then run. Run, run as fast as I can. Alright, give me a dexterity check. Thirteen. Plus dexterity, one to 14. 14. Uh, it smashes into the mead and uh, temptation goes smashing through the air. You grab Hark and dive to the side and land quite well so you can start running if you wanted to. Yeah, and I do. I want to start running. Uh, you hear from behind you, you again. 
and uh, you can all the soldiers, it almost sounds, if you can hear all of them at once, seem to turn in the village and start moving quickly, their running sound. They, they normally walk, but this time they're pounding through the village to get closer towards you. You can see the mountains on the outskirts of the town. Uh, there's forest in another direction, and of course the, the, the bay that swings around the other side. Uh, what would you like to do? I get down on my knee level and I say to Clark, I'm like, honey, I've got a plan, you can trust me. Um, and I hold him close. Take that mead. He says, okay. There's still plenty of Thunder Plus too. Energy mead. And he just grabs a couple of big, like, and they're huge too. Like this is like 400 years ago, they didn't understand serving sizes. So <laughs> like four litre mugs kind of thing. And he's strong, so here he grabs two. It's 27 glasses per bottle. That's right. And I'm like, okay, good work, honey. We're going to run towards that forest. Can you do that for me? He says, okay. And he suddenly reminds you of Sam. <laughs> he's got tears in his eyes and I'm like, I would die for you. And then we are going to run towards the forest. And as we run towards the forest, I am going to pick up some burning straw. You can hear the footsteps of the soldiers now getting closer uh, and closer, at least getting faster and faster. So you know they're chasing you. We're bolting. And I say, Hark, throw that mead everywhere. And I throw the straw down. It flames up and we keep running into the forest. You light it up. The forest starts catching on fire. The mead burns exceedingly well. Everything starts to, to burn very quickly, forming a wall of fire. You can still hear the stomping of the soldiers. And they walk straight through the fire. Oh my God. As though it has no impact upon them whatsoever. It doesn't slow them down, doesn't do any of these sort of things. Do you really think you can escape me? Then you hear in the sky the sound of wings beating and they grow louder. And the smoke of the fire that you cause is moving aside and the air is spun into whirls. Two large bird talons land between you and the soldiers. You see this creature just as giant bird turn to look at you and then he transforms into a man he walks over to you and puts his hand on your shoulder don't worry about the boy you got him far enough there won't be great days ahead for him but he will make it who are you and how do you know he'll be fine because i've done this many times trying to find a way to save them all each time he is the only one i I am the only one who survives, and each time it is you that saves me. And the man steps forward for a moment and casts a spell called Pass Without Trace. And as he does so, young Hark seems to just blend into the background and disappear. I would not know what to do with that. It's, I'm in shock. I want to save this kid. I think I'm just going to be like, F off, Birdman, um, and, and try and chase after him. I just don't feel like he's safe. I don't know you. I've never met you. I need to go for this child, leave me alone, and I push him. Uh, he's not holding you or anything like that, so he does step back when you push him, um, and you start to run away. And as you do that, he says, I'm sorry about this. And he casts a spell on you. What? Is, what? Is he, what? How, why? Uh, roll me a wisdom check. It's a three. Plus a whole lot of nothing. Uh, he casts Charm Person on you. Uh, and by doing this for at least one hour, you'll think that everything he says is in your favour. You think this person is trying to help you. You think this person is someone you can trust. Walks over to you again and he takes your hand. He pulls out a little fob watch and you hear some more words. And as he's speaking, one of those words stands out more than the others. And that word is Thassa. There's nothing more we can do here. If you come with me, I have a way to save them all. And then the sounds of the soldiers and the fire and the furious commander all fade. Keep searching. The world becomes white again and the roar of the avalanche returns. Don't worry about them. I'm sure they'll be fine. It's just a sudden ending. It happens all the time. So maybe there's danger or just a clever line But don't worry about them, I'm sure they'll be fine Right?